We're talking about um, Erendel, which is the farthest star that we have ever observed. People might call it the oldest star, but that's not quite right. It's the oldest light that we've ever observed from the star. Oh my goodness, like even as an astronomer, I can't even talk about distances. That's how far we're talking. So in astronomy, the farther you look back in distance is the farther you look back in time as well, because that light has had to travel huge distances, takes time to travel places just as it just takes us time to travel in a car. So this light is over 13 billion years old. So it has traveled about 13 billion it's about 13 billion light years. What's the big deal then? How, how come we can see it? Serendipity and sheer luck, I guess, both, both of these things together. So what was happening was a team of astronomers were sifting through old Hubble Space Telescope data, and they were looking for really far away galaxies that had been gravitationally lensed. So this is when there's a massive cluster of galaxies in the foreground acting as a natural magnifying glass so like Sherlock Holmes style magnifying glass it's acting like that so that anything that um, is lucky enough to kind of align line up behind it will appear to us far larger and sometimes brighter and it's also quite distorted as well so what happened was they were looking for signs of really far away galaxies that had been lensed so they could say yay we found a really far away galaxy what actually happened was they were looking and they were going, that galaxy looks strange. That's got a single star that has been magnified to, to thousands of times, even brighter than the galaxy that it's actually in. So this is like somebody in another galaxy looking at the Milky Way, but seeing the sun pop out far brighter and just as large as the rest of the galaxies. This is, this is really, really odd. The way you portray it, it seems like this star had to be in a very, very exact location, like, you know, like on a dime type thing. All of these things are moving. The galaxy it's in, the star itself, the galaxies in the foreground. So presumably it wasn't in this magic location for very long. That's a really good question. I. I don't know the answer to that, actually, because I'm not sure we have a measure of the velocity of that star. So you're absolutely right. Stars tend to orbit locally and they also orbit around, for example, a black hole at the centre of a galaxy. I'm not sure we have enough data to know kind of how fast this star is moving. But we're also talking about things that are so far away <laughs> that they're even though they're moving very fast, their their movement laterally seems to us extraordinarily slow so again it's kind of like looking at a plane flying in a sky you know it's going at oh god now you caught me i don't know how fast a plane goes i'm gonna say 300 miles an hour and you can write me you know if you had a car moving that fast in front of you you'd be like Wee! because it's a plane it's really far away tiny 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 movements and it's the same kind of thing we're looking at this star it's 13 billion light years away so yeah it might have been moving at a pace but all we know is that certainly for our lifetimes, there it is, there it, that, that snapshot in time, we've caught it. And what's happened to this star now? What's happened to that galaxy? We'll never know. That's the pain of astronomy. But um, we, it certainly won't be in the same place because it's had a 13 billion year lifetime. That galaxy has probably collided. That star is long dead. We do know that. We know that that particular star is long gone because we have a rough estimate of how big it is and therefore kind of how long it is going to take it for it to fuse all of its hydrogen before it, it goes supernova or dies in another way. And that was a long time ago, sadly, for Arendelle, which is the name of this star. Why is it called Arendelle? So that's called, I think it's Morning Star in Old English. So it's uh, spelled E-A-R. So it kind of sounds like Arendelle in terms of the frozen. <laughs> if you've got kids, you will know what I'm talking about. It sounds like Arendelle, but um, no, it's Arendelle. Yeah, and it's called Morning Star. And it's kind of, they, they called it that, I believe, because it's the first star, the morning star. So this is one of the first stars we've ever observed in terms of kind of, if you consider the the timeline of our universe. So after the Big Bang, things were very dark, very boring. It's called the Dark Ages. At some point, the first stars had to form. At some point, you had that spark of life almost, the fusion that starts in these clouds, the very, very lucky clouds of gas that are dense enough to ignite fusion. You have the first star, the second star, the third star. The fairy lights all over. That's why I love studying this area. 
it's just such a fun picture. Um, so Arendelle is one of the kind of earliest stars we've ever observed. It's not one of the first generation of stars, if you want to get pernickety. Um, I am a researcher of the first stars. Um, they are kind of a whole different group, a whole different species to themselves um, because of their chemical content. So we know that Arendelle's not one of those first ones, but it's darn close. So it is made from uh, remnants of other stars. It has got metal in it. It has got metal in it, exactly. So, so from what we can tell from the observations, it's not what we say is metal free which is what we call a first star. So it's first stars are just hydrogen, just helium. Presumably we've never seen one of those. We've never seen one of those. I, I spend my days <laughs> looking. There are several ways you can look for those. Um, you can look my way, which is looking back in time, which is using um, radio telescopes to look for the signatures of those very, very first stars igniting about 400 million years after the Big Bang, even earlier actually. Uh, and so we look for that in, in radio data. The other way you can do it is they have a way cooler name. So the stellar archaeologists, what they do is um, they look in the local Milky Way and they look for some of the first stars that might still be around today, um, camouflaged with all of the dirt from 13 billion years. And they, they almost, well, they do, they look at the light from these stars and they dust it off. They dust off all these metals and they're like, this could be a first star. Again, they've got so close. They've got a first descendant. It's, it's, they found a star with so few metals in that it can only have formed from the supernova of a first star. But they're not quite there. Coming back to Arendelle, have we learned anything about it? Like, have scientists, you know, I presume they've studied it to death. Like, what, what, do, what information did it glean, this lucky find? Yeah, well, we've only just... Uh, looked at it with JWST um, and we are starting to kind of dissect the data a little bit to find out that it is um, it's very hot so about 15,000 Kelvin. So if Hubble imaged it and they later on went and pointed yeah. James Webb at it presumably that means it's still in that serendipitous spot. Yes and I don't believe that it's it's going to be moving any time in our lifetimes because of humans are you know nothing and insignificant. But what they found was this line here which they've called the sunrise arc and that is a galaxy that's so far away that it has been lensed and distorted and then yeah you can see a few star kind of other big clusters of stars here but this one is Arendelle. That's the one that they looked at and they were like, wait, that's not just an image of a galaxy. That's the image of a single star. So is Arendelle in that same galaxy that's been sunrised? Then? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so to, to the best of our knowledge, so there's, there's been loads of talk, especially when it was just the Hubble data of, well, couldn't this just be something that is actually quite, the, you know, the same colour, the same redness that's much closer that just has happened to get in the way. Like, like a photo bomb. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like some like a brown dwarf has just been like, yo, yeah. <laughs> let's mess with these guys. Um, but again, you can kind of tell from the different metallicities, the different patterns in the light. So especially with JWST data, looking more carefully at that light, it, it is looking like it really is one of these father, the father star and just the luckiest incident that I've come across in my field yet. So a holy grail of your field would be to have a first generation star pop into one of these lens images. That would be the holy grail. Is it possible? It's almost impossible in terms of the our ability to, to, to have been looking at the right place at the right time with the right telescope however there are there are there's a bit of hope with JWST so for example these first ever stars they um, they die in huge explosions called pair instability supernovae like massive the brighter supernovae if that happens and it's lensed with something in the JWST field then we could actually fairly easily see that so we could more easily see the first death of a star than the beginnings of a first star so to, to really understand their lives and their beginnings if you were to find a first generation star in one in an image like this what would you learn because you already know it's going to be made of hydrogen and helium like it feels like almost there's nothing to know it would be a lovely find it would be like a nice trophy but it feels like there's not 
much science to get from it because it's got no metal in it. So there is definitely the element of a historian in me. Um, I wanted to be an Egyptologist and like it, it was in, only when I found out that I could kind of open the lost tomb of space time and, and get the Holy Grail in that way that I became interested in this. So there's a huge element for me in terms of let's complete the collection, let's understand the earliest civilization of stars. However, the universe is a playground. The universe is the place that fusion scientists get to test their theories of fusion. And there, there are very few, well, there are no stars in our current galaxy that we know of that are fusing purely hydrogen and helium. So that's, that's a test. These are massive stars. So we are talking um, 100 times solar mass kind of on average. You can get massive stars like that in the Milky Way. You can get ones up to, you know, 100 solar masses. You can find them, but they're rare. And so that's a small sample size. And if you're a scientist, small sample sizes should really concern you. You go, you look back in time. It doesn't really matter that they're old. What matters is that you've got a massive sample size of massive stars. They're all 100 solar masses or even up to 1,000 solar masses. So it's... it's you have to see it as a, as, a, as a laboratory, or if you're less serious like me, like a playground, where you can just apply all these amazing theories, but to a completely different situation that you, you can't replicate. You can't replicate anymore. Let me ask a question then of that historian and romantic in you. <laughs> what do you think about that one star, long since gone, that has become like famous, like it, it, it could... It could have had no idea. Or it, <laughs> no one could have had any idea that that would be the one that would be presented to a civilization 13 billion years in the future. Like, that's cool. For sure. It is cool. It is cool. It's why I think it's why they name it. So people pick me up sometimes for saying things like, oh, this star, like, it, it, it came to life. Like, it, it, the fusion ignited its, you know, its lifetime. And thing. But actually... All of the scientists that I think really get close to these objects can do that. You have the historical figures like Cecilia Payne-Kaboshkin, who described the stars as her, as her best friends, and she, she knew them all intimately in terms of their spectra. And I think that's why, why they named it, because they could have just said O-H-S-T-S. But what they did was they gave it a name. And I think, you know, as humans, when something is important, we do give it a name. And this is a, such a special star. It might not be special when it existed, but in terms of what has happened since, in terms of that lensing event, this might never, ever happen again. So it's absolutely worthy of a name, and I think it's it's a good choice. It's a good choice of a name. When you think about all the different angles and geometries that exist in space, though, there might be a chance that we are currently being lensed from the perspective of another civilization. For sure. I mean, this is something I think about a lot because I have a, a sideline kind of hobby with the undergraduates in SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, it's a fun project to do. And yeah, I'm kind of always feeling like I'm being watched a little bit. And absolutely one of the projects I worked with them on last summer was what happens if somebody's using the sun as a gravitational lens. So normally we're talking about these big galaxies, but if you use the sun as a gravitational lens, then all of our radio emissions from I Love Lucy, which is what we call like the first big, big emission that we sent, which was a sitcom in the in the 50s in America. Um, yeah, that's all being lensed and magnified to, to someone and they just have to get in the right place and, and they can they can hear everything you're saying. <laughs> You can go even deeper into some of these topics by reading Dr. Chapman's book, First Light, Switching on Stars at the Dawn of Time. Dr. Chapman's an astronomer at the University of Nottingham, where maybe you could study physics and astronomy. I'll include links to both her book and the university in the video description. We've got plenty more videos on all sorts of physics and astronomy here on 60 Symbols, or you can go a bit deeper into specific astronomical objects on our sister channel, Deep Sky Videos. You know the drill links in all the usual places.